Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization dedicated to peace, economic and social justice, good government, and a clean environment. Every month, we invite an expert to enlighten us on a topic related to our mission. Because Village TV videotapes these presentations, we can share that expertise with a larger audience. We hope you enjoy today's broadcast. My name is Alan Feldman. I'm the Vice President of uh, Concerned Citizens. I want to welcome everybody here tonight, and I want to thank you for coming out here tonight. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you all for supporting Concerned Citizens, whether you support us as a member or as a guest. Your support, your presence is very much appreciated. Uh, our speaker tonight is Professor Mario Barnes, who's going to be talking to us about uh, the Supreme Court. What I'm going to do is introduce Barbara Siri, who's currently uh, the, uh, the chairman of our uh, program committee, and uh, she is going to introduce uh, Professor Mario Barnes. Wait for your applause for the real star. Oh, oh and they're applauding here, of course, of course. I am so happy we have our legal eagle here, um, uh, Professor Mario Barnes, who was, uh, I was having a heart attack out there waiting for him, and it turns out he dropped his phone and had to go back for it. He was sitting in the parking lot in 19. I'm just so glad he found it. But anyway, I love introducing uh, constitutional lawyers because I hope it gives me a chance to say my legal terms like ipso facto and habeas corpus. I like to just kind of work that into uh, introductions. Um, uh, the famous uh, Charlie versus McCarthy case that we were discussing over dinner. But anyway, Mr. Um, Dr. Mario Barnes is a, a professor of constitutional law at UC Irvine School of Law a nationally recognized scholar for his research on the legal and social implications of race and gender, primarily in the areas of employment, education, criminal and military law, all really critical um, topics. He's a Berkeley graduate, undergraduate, and law school with an LLM from the University of Wisconsin. Need I say more? Uh, Mr. Mario Barnes. Take it away. Um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about a few things tonight because I figured um, anytime you get in front of um, uh, concerned citizens, um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to talk about a diverse set um, of topics that relate to the Supreme Court and the Constitution. So rather than doing what I just did in, uh, um, at the beginning of the July, which was sit on a panel that did um, the Supreme Court Charter Review. What I thought I would do tonight is talk just a tiny bit um, about a few of the important cases from the 22-23 term, um, have a bit of a conversation um, about where the U.S. Supreme Court finds itself um, in the year 2023 in terms of my own belief that um, it may be um, at a place where there is a high, a high crisis of public confidence, um, both um, in terms of the decisions of the court and certainly in the behaviors of the court outside of the court. Um, and then introduce you to a few of the cases that are coming up um, in the 23-24 uh, term, at least ones where I think uh, there will be opportunities for the court to say something new, interesting, or um, otherwise a wrinkle in the current doctrine. And then um, we'll end um, with me hopefully answering any questions about anything uh, I've talked about or the court in general. So, uh, let's start off with the term that just ended, and the Supreme Court does this a lot, but for a, um, a lot of the term, we were sitting around waiting for some of the more controversial cases, and we actually didn't get them until the last few days um, of the term. Um, and two of the cases, three of the cases that came down at the end of the term are at the top of this list. And so, um, SFFA stands for, um, a, I think it's Students for Fair Admissions, versus Harvard, that case actually combined suits against two schools, um, Harvard and the University of North Carolina. Um, and the question was something that the court has been asking itself at least since the Bakke decision in 1978, which, which is the way in which um, institutions of higher education can actually um, consider race as a part of their admissions. And so Harvard and UNC, in keeping with the doctrine that was announced in Bakke, 
um, and affirmed in the Grutter cases in the early 2000s, had policies which um, admitted students based on a holistic review that considered grades and test scores and extracurricular, extracurricular activities, um, but also included what they considered holistic reviews um, of social background factors such as race. And so the question brought by SFFA um, to the court was whether the consideration um, of race by Harvard and US, in UNC violated the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. And uh, this is not a new question. We saw the Bakke case, we saw the Bruder and Gratz cases, and the court had answered this question several years again in the Fisher case, which was um, a Texas case, and Justice Kennedy, and the only opinion in the history of his time on the court uh, where he found the use of a racial classification that he could approve, uh, sat with the majority, and I think it was a, a 4 3 majority because of the recusal um, of Justice Kagan, but in the majority, um, they had decided that if you use the method that Harvard and UNC were using, holistic review that considered race among um, many other factors, that it was constitutional. Um, that is not what the court found in SFFA versus Harvard. Um, the court actually found that the way in which schools were using race as a proxy for diversity uh, was not something that messed with the standard that the court uses in cases such as this, which is a, a standard we call strict scrutiny, right? Uh, and that standard says, um, before the government can ever use any racial classification, that it has to have a really important reason, that's what we call the compelling interest part of the test, um, and even if it has a really important reason, the means it selects to implement the program have to be really narrowly tailored for the narrow tailoring prong. And so rather than taking the precedent and walking us through it, the court basically said that Harvard and UNC were using standards related to diversity, which was something that was not well defined or explained, um, and that what they were really doing is basically running a system that was advantaging some uh, students of some particular races and disadvantaging others. Um, and ultimately, without confronting the previous precedent, um, squarely, they simply said, um, this is a violation, and they reached that conclusion really by not picking up at Fisher and asking whether this case introduced something different from Fisher, but instead reading across the history of all of the affirmative action cases, much in the same way they had done in the Dobbs case in the previous term, um, and deciding, and I quote Justice Roberts here, that if you're going to end racism, then you have to end all of racism. Um, and Interestingly, even though um, that's what the justice said, there are two caveats in the case. Caveat one is this applies to all institutions of higher education except the military academies, we are told. Yeah. <laughs> Caveat two, the, the university can't consider race as a regularized part of its process of considering students, but a student can raise um, race and how the issue has affected them in their own personal essay, and the school is not prohibited. Um, from that consideration. But it was a significant deviation from the previous um, several cases that have answered this question, and to the extent the answer was it violated um, the Constitution, that is um, a very different ruling. Um, second, a lot of people were waiting for 303 Creative um, versus Alanis, um, and this was an interesting case mostly because um, most people didn't think that even the conservative court um, would endorse an opinion that suggested um, that someone based on their own religious or moral values would be allowed to deny services um, to individuals who sought those services as a part of um, a contractual work arrangement. And this case is about um, someone who claimed um, that to the extent there was a state law um, uh, requiring them under public accommodations to assist people who wanted services from them to design websites, that if they wanted a website designed for a purpose that was counter to their own values, so in this case it was if a gay or lesbian couple wanted me to design their wedding website, to the extent the court, um, to the extent the state law forced me to design that website, that the, the, the state was then um, co-opting my voice um, and my expressive conduct. And most of us thought the work that was being described actually wasn't voice or expressive conduct. But um, to our surprise, what the court told us was um, the Constitution does protect this right of workplace expressive conduct from government regulation, including, um, uh, in this case, the, the right to deny services um, to the phantom um, client. And why I say that is, in the fact, what we learned after the case is that there really weren't um, clients um, who were a gay couple seeking this service um, from the, the person who brought the claim, and that it seems to be a lot of the facts in this case um, were actually manufactured. 
um, that does not change the fact that on the question um, of whether you provide some service with the court can deem um, expressive or you know, emblematic of your voice, um, that to the extent a state or a local ordinance attempts to compel or require you um, to do some work, it could be um, uh, unlawful as an infringement. Um, I, I, I said at dinner, and it was only a half joke, you know, well, we, I just had delicious salmon prepared by um, a chef, but maybe I'll be told in the future that he is a culinary artist, um, and that um, forcing him to serve me would be in opposition to his long-held values of I don't know what. Not serving people who don't enjoy salmon in the right way, I don't know what it might be. This opens up a whole kind of set of conversations um, around what it means to engage in expressive conduct. Um, it also really does move the court backwards on the gains they have made um, since the Lawrence, the Lawrence and marriage equality cases, which have protected a sphere of both uh, adult private intimacy and the right of marriage for all um, in a way that certainly a more progressive court might have seen at stake in this case. Um, Biden versus Nebraska, any of you with students and, and grand students um, who are in college, and paying for it, might have wanted a different result in Biden versus Nebraska, which um, it was the case in which the president had sought to use executive power um, uh, to cancel out student loan debt, uh, using a statute that says in times of emergency, uh, the, the president can essentially stay or modify um, uh, uh, loan uh, requirements or arrangements. And there were, these, there were several states who sued First of all, it's not clear how they were suing because they really didn't have standing. What does that mean? It's not clear how the states were injured uh, by the student loan debt being canceled, but they sued. Now, this is an interesting case because um, in previous terms, certainly um, during the Trump administ administration, the court had been all about expansive interpretations of executive power. So how many of you have heard of the Trump versus Hawaii case? So that's the travel ban case, right? So Trump comes in and says, you, if you're from these countries um, that are associated um, with terror, to his mind, others would have said that are um, places where Muslims and Arabs um, are large members of the populations, that then you are banned from traveling to the US. And in that case, the court says um, that the statute gives the president the discretion to make the determination on who can be admitted, um, and that he used you know, his good sense um, that's not upon his good sense, and um, the information from his um, uh, uh, administrative departments to make a determination as to which countries were affected. So the court, the conservative court had been a court in favor of preserving statutorily created um, executive power. But in the case of Joe um, Biden and canceling loan debt, they basically claimed the words of the statute did not mean what he thought they meant. Um, and to the extent he was presuming to have the power under that statute, to cancel the debt, um, that that wasn't um, lawful. Now, there, there is this question of um, the president manipulating facts to his favor, right? Because the statute was about giving the president limited power at a time of emergency. I don't think the, the, the legislatures who um, created the statute thought about global pandemic um, and what that might mean. Um, and so there, is, there was some arguing in language about this is not the type of thing um, uh, that the legislators um, uh, assumed the president would use the power for, but an emergency is an emergency is an emergency. I say being trapped in my house for two years was an emergency. Um, and so um, ultimately, however, the president had no power or authority under the statute. The president is trying another tact in which he will use another presumed authority, um, not to the same extent in terms of the, um, the many billions of dollars that will be canceled, but his, the position of the administration is the president does enjoy the power uh, to place limits on this, and they will try a new statutory or executive uh, uh, means to achieve it. And then finally, maybe the only surprising case of the term. I, mean, I don't necessarily love the previous opinions, but they were pretty much consistent with a court that has a hypermajority um, of conservative justices. But in Allen versus Milligan, in which Alabama uh, issued a redistricting plan after the um, census of 2020 that ignored the growth in its black population, many people thought that the court was going to say um, it was fine for um, the redistricting plan not to um, redistrict in a manner that included two majority black districts, right? So the population growth among African Americans suggested that they would end up uh, with two rather than one of the seven districts, and then Alabama said, 
uh, no, we're keeping it the same, and then the residents um, of Alabama sued, claiming it was a violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And most people thought that the, the court, um, uh, keeping with its sort of majority and speaks on state power, um, would say that the state could um, redistrict without violating um, uh, Section 2. Um, but that's not what happened. In a 5-4 decision, uh, the court actually um, uh, overturned the Alabama redistricting plan, claiming that it did, in fact, uh, violate Section 2, meaning that they failed to properly um, account for um, uh, the black population as a political body um, and tried to, to divest them of their voting franchise. And uh, we shouldn't get so excited about this, even though it's, it may um, portend um, some connection to an upcoming case, because Justice Kavanaugh, who wrote separately, was very particular about the racial dynamics of this district, which led him to side with the majority. And it's not clear that he's necessarily an, an advocate of uh, siding with petitioners rather than the state um, uh, when the state offers a reason for why um, it's redistricted in a way and where the individuals are claiming it's based on race. So he seemed to be a limited vote for yes in this particular case. Uh, but he might uh, at another time, and it could be as early as this upcoming term, um, vote differently. But um, so, other than Milligan, not very surprising. Why? Because um, conservative justices um, have long uh, had some concerns about affirmative action. Um, uh, although I will say that up until um, this opinion, probably the leading opinion on affirmative action, Grutter, uh, was championed and written by Justice um, O'Connor. Um, uh, I think even though it's consistent with um, certain conservative values on the court, many people were surprised at the 303 creative decision, but that seems to be to be a function um, of Justice Kennedy leaving the court, as Justice Kennedy was the champion um, for adult private intimacy and recognizing the rights of, uh, of, of all to have access um, to marriage. And the, the decision in Biden versus Nebraska seems to be well, we want presidents to have broad executive power when they are the presidents we like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I use this as a segue to talk a little bit more about the court before we consider some cases that are coming uh, up in the next term. So I want to talk about two things, trouble inside and trouble outside the court, potentially. Um, and by that, I mean there have been um, issues related to our current uh, court, some of them about the um, decisions that have been coming out of the court, the way they've been operating with each other, but more recently um, about the behaviors and activities of Supreme Court justices. So let's start with the trouble inside. Um, many constitutional commentators, and I among them, my dear friend and co-author Irvin Chemerinsky um, agrees with this too, is that um, the court has always been um, a, a body where differing um, interpretations and opinions and commitments to certain things, originalism versus um, you know, other forms of interpretive tools have existed. But many of us agree that what we have now is a historical moment where the court um, among the justices seems more divided than ever, which is to say that the, the range of sort of political commitments um, is not one that is, um, where the space between the justices is modest or moderate. It seems that we have extreme, more extreme polarities uh, on the court. And so we have this problem where there seems to be um, these extremities in terms of interpretation of values, but we also have seen some violations of norm breaking uh, or some norm breaking on the court. So in the Dobbs case, um, uh, which was always going to be um, politically fraught, one of the things that happened was the, a, an advanced copy of the majority opinion was released. Um, historically, we have almost never seen um, Supreme Court opinions released um, surreptitiously or um, prior to the opinions. Why? Because everybody who serves on the court is wed to the idea of the court. And that's not just the justices, that's their clerks, um, and uh, that's everybody who works with the court. But in order for that to, opinion to have been leaked, it, it really could have only come from one of two places, one of the justices, and. How, you know, the hell you say, would one of them actually do that to their colleagues? Um, or, and more people would theorize this was more likely, um, one of their clerks, right? But, but still, um, it violated the fidelity of the rule of the way the court operates, and, and Chief Justice Roberts was incensed by this, by the way. But the point being is, 
We didn't get that in times past because I don't think the polarity was as extreme. Um, and this was somebody who sort of felt like people need to know as soon as possible that they're about to overturn Roe and Casey. Um, and then finally, I mean, I don't know how I feel about this because I think the court has always in some ways been um, uh, politically influenced, but there are folks now who believe the court has become so influenced uh, by politics that it resembles more a political rather than a judicial body, right? Which is, so my students now, many of them are so cynical, um, right? Which is when, when I try to get them to discuss legal principles and try to explicate what are the contours or elements of the legal principles, at work, they were often say, isn't it just that the law is whatever five justices agree to? And I can't say no to that, because that's actually true. Um, with, with what five or more justices agree to is what becomes law. But what I try to suggest to them is how they reach that arrangement and agreement should be informed uh, by um, cases that have been decided before, by legal principles, by um, things that matter in terms of how people will be affected. And I would like them to think that there is some other explanation other than the political leaning of the justice. Um, I think, unfortunately, by becoming hyperpolarized, people now um, have focused in on the politics being the leading kind of influence on the decision making. And so I don't know that this generation of students is as inclined as I was to believe um, that there is a way for the Supreme Court to do its work that can allow for differing interpretations and differences of opinions, uh, where those differences are principled, and where people can have different religious values and political um, affiliations, but they also are independent-minded and committed to the ideas and the common goal of the court, which is to, you know, to seek um, justice um, and interpret the Constitution in a way that honors uh, what that founding document means to us. And so my sense now is if you look at the survey data, and this is sad, this, it has always been true that the presidency and the Congress have been places where um, uh, at many times there's been low public confidence in the executive or Congress, but the court for many years enjoyed um, a better reputation. Um, and one where we thought they were doing their level best to balance issues that were often difficult. Um, I think that if you look at current surveys of the court, not quite as bad as the Congress um, uh, or the president, but there's much less confidence um, uh, in the court doing their level best. Um, it's much more like, well, who appointed you um, and what did they want and or like? So that's a, the trouble inside. The trouble outside only appears to be trouble for us because to, ex to the extent the issue is them taking perks and benefits um, from outsiders, they seem to be enjoying it just fine. Um, there is potentially, however, a problem with it. So um, just by way of information, I spent my life in practice as a government attorney. Um, I was in the Navy JAG Corps and worked for the Department of Justice. During that time, I was subject to the um, Office of Government Ethics Standards of Conduct. And those standards of conduct not only described how I had to treat my clients, um, uh, but the standards of conduct said any time somebody who could have business before the government um, uh, appeared before me, I should consider them what we call a prohibited source, and I should not accept any gift of greater than the value of $20 on one occasion or $50 in a year from that source. And if I did, I could be prosecuted. And I actually, and I mean this, I gave people warnings and administrative punishment and letters for violating that. Um, and in the Navy, we had similar rules for contracting um, and attorneys. But here was the whole point. As a government attorney, it is my duty to uphold the public trust. And that means that I can't be seen as someone whose loyalties or interests have been paid for. Um, it also means that I have to be beyond reproach, and it can't just be that I'm not doing anything bad. I can't even look like I'm doing anything bad. We call that the appearance of impropriety. So, I'm a government attorney, I read these standards, I enforce them, I'm fine. All government attorneys have those conduct rules. All federal judges below the Supreme Court um, have a, a code of conduct that, in, that requires similar foregoing um, of gifts and avoiding of prohibited sources. The Supreme Court, however, is given the privilege of regulating its own ethics, which means to the extent 
I don't believe they have a code. They claim they have their own internal policy. I have not seen it. But to the extent they have their own internal policy, it is internal and self-regulatory, which means they decide on what is acceptable. Now, I want to tell you it's been pretty much known for a lot of years, um, some of this. And I'll give you the, the parts I've known about because I've seen them all the time. Many Supreme Court justices are asked to teach in law school summer programs. Usually the ones in Italy, and Spain, and France, and Mallorca, and, and you know, it's like, oh, Justice Kennedy is coming back again, right? And so, so the point is, but, but that's sort of like the, the, the wink and nod to, they actually come, they teach a one credit course, they interact with your students, but you can then pay for their travel to and from, their accommodation and their dinner, you cannot pay them a salary. I'll give you another one. Um, uh, several years ago, and now, several years ago, when I was a dean, a justice came uh, because they had written a book, um, and I invited them to the law school I was in at the University of Washington. There were big events, and the truth was, we didn't pay them a salary to come. We paid for their travel. They met with the public, uh, but we did buy X many hundreds of, actually thousands of books um, that we gave out gratis to individuals. Now the justice did sign them um, for a handful of people. But the point being, it wasn't direct, you know, contribution, but to the extent their book sales both indirectly increase their reputational metrics and I would imagine directly do, in some cases, um, increase their financial um, uh, well-being. That, that was the kind of, we understand it and it's okay. I never knew there was a world where donors are taking you on their private yachts and paying for your nephews to go to college and buying your mama's house. I was like, oh, Lord, where'd this, where, where this come from? <laughs> and, and, and where are the ethics attorneys? And, and the thing is, I, I love the fact that um, some of them are just, you know, um, insist by the idea that you think somebody whining and dining them and, and, and you know, uh, gifting them hundreds of thousands of dollars would ever have anything to do with their opinion on any matter. <laughs> what do you think we are? You don't want to know what I think you are, but I will tell you that a common person would look at that and say, it's problematic. Yeah. Which is to say, justices shouldn't be for sale. Um, and even if it turns out, and this is, I believe this, even if it turns out, this rich billionaire who happens to, you know, who is a rich billionaire just happens to share my conservative values, I'm not in any way beholden to them. I'm going to take you back to the words I uttered a few moments ago, appearance of impropriety. I don't know whether Justice Thomas is beholden. I don't know whether Justice Alito is beholden. I know he's ticked off about you asking him about it. How dare you? Well, you know, so I, but I do know that a common person of average intelligence is not wrong to suggest this looks fishy. Um, and if you want me not to think it's fishy, create some rules for standards so that we can understand where the lines are. So my sense is Justice Roberts says, well, we're going to approach this and figure something out, but it's going to be self-regulating. Um, I, I don't know if that's the right answer. And I don't know why Congress isn't more willing to say, we have the power to prescribe you know, um, uh, some limits on judicial ethics for the Supreme Court. Um, now, that is an actual constitutional question because, as you know, con Congress is a body of limited powers, um, typically those articulated in um, Article One or the Reconstruction Amendments, um, and it doesn't have to be that the power file, file you know, uh, that the power is explicitly referenced, but it has to be something that um, is necessary and proper for achieving something that is explicitly referenced. So, so Congress would have to search for a power, but I do think um, we have not heard the end of this. And it's almost, it's, it's, you know, every other day there's a new revelation. Like some, someone's like, oh, you heard the Congress thing? I'm like, yeah, that's what you could go. No, yesterday. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, I can't keep up with the ways in which um, he is, you know, lining his pockets with gifts from others. Okay, so, okay, so these are, uh, three of the four cases, there's one other slide that I will briefly tell you. The court has um, accepted to review in the upcoming 23-24 term, and you can look at those dates. There are the dates for oral argument. Um, and these are the, a brief statement um, of the issues, but um, as we get to the slide on the individual cases, I will speak about it more. So the first is this Pulsker case uh, versus U.S. I know we have people who have done criminal work. 
This case turns out to be really a statutory interpretation case about what the language of a statute means. So I have to tell you something I really don't like in this country and has contributed significantly to mass incarceration um, is a set of federal sentencing guidelines which include mandatory minimum punishments, right? So many of you might have heard. So this tough on crime sort of federalizing of uh, criminal conduct um, took hold in the 80s and we ended up with lots of people going to jail for very long times for very, what we might think of as minor offenses. For instance, um, if you had you know, five to 12 grams of crack cocaine, you could go to jail uh, for 12 or more years. Um, and in order to go to jail for a similar amount of time, uh, you would have to possess 100 times the amount of powder cocaine. And so this was a rule that actually ended up in putting lots of young black men from inner cities um, uh, in federal prisons for very small amounts of possession. But why? Well, because until recently, there was this understanding that if there's a federal mandatory minimum, uh, that the judges couldn't deviate. So we end up with a case several years ago that gives judges some ability, finally, um, uh, to deviate from the, the sentencing guidelines. But then there's a statute. We'll talk about a statute. The statute created um, the ability for a downward deviation as long as you had not um, committed some prior offenses. In this case, Pulsifer is about what those prior offenses um, look like. Which are the prior offenses that put you on the good list, which put you on um, the bad list. And it's in, I'll explain it when we get there, but it's a, it's a point system. Um, the second case, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau versus Community Financial Service Association, um, basically asked whether the particular funding mechanism for the CFPB violates the appropriations clause of the Constitution. Well, let me give you the real story on uh, this case. So this case is actually brought by payday lenders. Um, you know these people, these wonderful characters who charge usurious high amounts of interest for people who are make, barely making ends meet and borrowing money against next month's check to pay this month's rent. And so um, payday lenders um, did not like the fact that after the uh, CFPB came into effect, they created a rule that said, you may draw, if you have a, a, an arrangement with someone who took out a payday loan, you can draw against their account up to two times when there's a failed draw. And what that means is, if they owe you money and they've given you the right to automatically deduct from their account, if there was one failure when you try to do it, you can do it one more time. But after two failures, you are not allowed to try to do the automatic draw. And, and why, would the, why would the CFPB be concerned about this? Because every time you try to take a draw against an account that has insufficient funds, you are creating uh, additional fines and fees for the account holder. And look, and if they had the money, would they have come to you for the payday loan in the first place? But uh, understanding, so it was a way to try to limit the power of the payday loan holders um, uh, from creating fees on the accounts of, of poor folks. And the payday loan people, I have to say this, they did, they got some good lawyer. Because here's what they were like, how can, we hate this rule. We don't like this rule, but they actually can make this rule, right? Because the power of the CPFB is to monitor this very type of transaction. And then they, they were geniuses. They said, well, we can't challenge the rule, but we can challenge the existence of the CFPB. Why? Because it's funded through money that comes from the Federal Reserve, not through direct congressional appropriation. And if it turns out um, that it's not appropriately funding, then the decisions they made vis-a-vis um, -vis the payday loan companies are unlawful. So they're basically, this is the um, swinging big <laughs> to, to, to solve a very small problem for a subset of lenders. Um, and then, Actors in Hotel versus Lofter is one of the most interesting set of facts I've read in a very long time. So, some of you might be familiar with, in civil rights cases, we have this process where we have testers. And, and so, if you want to know if somebody is using um, race or gender um, or national origin or one of the protected classifications improperly um, as a way to exclude people, you create a tester, right? So you send in a, a person in, uh, who's in the category and see if they're offered service, um, and then you send in someone who's not in the category and see if they're offered service. So uh, if you say you have no rooms to one but you do to the other, we can think that the, the classification is doing some work. So this person in offer is somebody who considers themselves um, their own, uh, you know, they consider themselves a tester even though they're not working for any research body or any government body. Um, and they spent a significant amount of their time acting as a personal tester, but also suing a lot of people 
um, uh, when they believe that they are um, essentially violating the American with Disabilities Act or, or not doing the things they were supposed to for uh, people who are disabled. So when we get to the, the slide, um, there's some interesting facts that are now going on around that. But the case involves someone who's suing a hotel because they failed to, uh, in theory, um, do what they should in, in order to accommodate disabled uh, 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 visitors to the hotel. And then finally, we'll talk about, we have another redistricting case um, in this upcoming term. And that's why it's important to, to understand that Justice Kavanaugh was very careful in limiting his joining of the majority um, in Milligan and Alabama, because this time we have um, South Carolina. Um, and again, post the 2020 census, uh, they drew a redistricting map. And um, this time, they decided to move a bunch of people to preserve a Republican district. The lion's share of the people who they moved uh, were African American. So we'll talk about um, this case as well and, and what uh, Milligan from the last term might mean for it. So let's go to uh, Pulsifer. So uh, Mark Pulsifer actually pleaded guilty to distributing 50 grams of methamphetamine, which is a controlled substance under the Controlled Substances Act. Um, and there is a statute, however, 18 United States Code 3553F, which says you may ask the district court to lower your sentences um, as long as you don't have a certain number of points on your record for previous offenses. And the actual statute says um, it speaks to having a particular kind of four-point offense, and then a three-point offense, and then finally uh, a two-point offense um, with a use of violence. So it's just describing different levels of offense, and so from his criminal history. And so he said, look, I, I have, you know, one, I have one of those things, but I don't have all of those things, so I should be able, because it seems to suggest you have to have all of these other types of offenses in order to be excluded from who can um, argue for sentence relief. Why is this important? So I'm not sure how many, well, I, I don't even know how many people have experience with the criminal justice system. I'll just, just explain it to you as a, a person who did former criminal justice work. Most um, criminals in the system have more than one offense, right? So I don't want to call people recidivists because I actually think a lot of what um, gets charged as crime is, is linked to things like poverty and lack of opportunity and access. But the truth is, it's rare that you will get somebody who commits one crime one time and never offends again. So a lot of time you'll have somebody like Mr. Pulsifer who has priors. Um, and what happens in the federal system, and states do this too, California charges you um, on the charging sheet with priors, but um, they, they basically assign point values to your criminal history, and depending on the point values, it might allow you access to some additional um, uh, favorable treatment. Here, it's really important. If you fit within um, the system so that your point values aren't uh, high, so high, you can actually deviate from the mandatory minimum. What does that mean? It means you can get a lesson sentence. So this guy, who's probably a non-violent offender, who's, a, who's been arrested for selling drugs, looks and sees that he has some points, but he says, it's most important, I don't have any points for violence, and I don't have all three category of points, so I should be able to allege, um, you know, under the statute that I get the downward deviation. Um, and the district court, in this case, ruled that, um, the, that the statute didn't apply to him, um, even though he hadn't committed a crime of violence that was worth two points, and the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals um, affirm that issue, and this is why it's a case of statutory interpretation. The court is reading the statute as, <laughs> as saying, if you have any one of these point categories, right, they list three categories, one of them is being um, two points for a crime committed with violence. Um, and he says, look, I, I read the statute to say, if, you know, you don't get to use the, the, the downward enhancement if you have these three Thing. If you don't have all three of these things, and actually what the, the court says is, no, um, uh, we read it you know, as an or, so we're reading the and as an or, basically. So if you have one of these, you're locked out of using it. It's sort of what the court um, are, are saying. So we're going to, to hear from the court how they interpret the statute. It is not unusual um, for statutes to be um, imprecise. Um, and how they use terms. For, for many years, um, California's standard for um, not reason by, uh, not, not guilty by reason of insanity had, an, had a, a wording error in it, um, right? It meant to describe the conditions as four conditions, but instead used an aim, and the court just took judicial notice that it was the wrong word. 
Um, but in this case, we'll find out um, whether the court is right in its interpretation, the lower courts, or whether Mr. Um, Pulsifer is right. I hope Mr. Pulsifer is right for two reasons. We, we punish people too long for too much, and I would like more people to get the downward deviation. I also think that probably he is right in this way. The, the, violent, the crimes we worry about the most are crimes of violence. And so if what he's missing is that he has not committed a crime of violence, maybe that's the very kind of thing that um, uh, should matter in determining who gets the benefit um, of statutory relief. Um, so this next one, again, I told you, it's the, the payday lenders um, strike back. So if you look at what the, the Consumer um, Financial Protection Board, it was created by Congress um, in, in 2007. It's an independent agency uh, uh, aligned under the Federal Reserve, and its whole goal is writing and enforcing rules for financial institutions, monitoring and reporting on markets, tracking consumer complaints. It's an organization that's basically there to help consumers. And so um, the whole point is typically with government agencies, there's an appropriation from Congress. Congress sends that to the Office of the Executive. They dole that out to the administration or the administrative agency. What happens with the CFPB is that the Federal Reserve actually collects fees uh, from its member banks, and they use the fees from the member banks uh, to fund the CFPB. And so what happened is the, the payday lenders looked at that and said, hey, that's not being funded on a direct appropriation from Congress. And so they basically challenged um, uh, that it's funded improperly. And the lower court was like, this is interesting because it will matter after this case. The lower court's like, yeah, you know, you're pulling, you're grasping at straws and we're not going to invalidate this because as it turns out, there are actually lots of government administrative agencies that are funded on alternative models, right? Which means they're not funded through, some get funded by fines and fees, some get funded by member networks, but the point is they're like, you're, you're, you're out of your board. Um, lots of things is funded differently. But then they get to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal says, wait a minute, you're right. That's not an appropriation. And rules for the payday lenders. Um, to which the CFPB and the administration are now um, appealing. Um, and the question really is whether the CFPB's funding violates the appropriation clause, and there's the wording, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by the law, right? And so the, this is going to be one of those, I think there are two things to think about. Whether in this day and age we still think about interpreting the Constitution literally, or we understand that as we have the growth of the administrative state, that there, are, there is constitution, uh, constitutional allowances for alternate arrangements. So, so that's one kind of way to think of it. But the other way to think about it is, is the Supreme Court willing to issue a result that would completely destabilize um, the funding of a significant number of administrative agencies? Now, I used to be naive, so I used to say things like, I don't think that will happen. <laughs> now I'm old, you see all the gray in the beard. Now I say things like, hmm, wonder what's going to happen. And because the problem is there are some strict constructionists on the court, right? The strict constructionist says, I don't think about the relevance of the language within the context of the moment we live in. I just think about what the words mean on the page, and often strict constructionists are also originalists, and I think about what the framers meant when they put that language in. And Justice Thomas, famous uh, among uh, people who describe themselves in both ways, I think he would be happy for the CFPB and every agency um, uh, to be defunded if he believes that they are not following the absolute letter of the Constitution. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens. But you know, note the difference in the courts. The district court is so pragmatic. What are you talking about? Lots of agencies have alternative funding arrangements. But the, the Fifth Circuit says, well, no, the law is the law. We read the interpretation as, you know, as it's written, we read the wording as it's written, and it seems to us that this is not funded through um, a direct appropriation from Congress, so the question is one um, uh, that can now go to the court if they appeal, but we, um, but we agree that it violates the appropriation clause. Again, why does this matter? It matters because if, in fact, the CFPB was improperly funded, it means it wasn't a valid um, constitutionally 
um, uh, uh, provided for body, which is to say, if they were funded improperly, none of the decisions they made while they were funded improperly um, uh, are, uh, will be upheld. So if they are funded improperly, the payday loan folks win, right? Because it means the rules they issued weren't lawful. And they can go back to hitting your bank account every two minutes if they want to, irrespective of how many fees um, it creates for you, um, because uh, until they are properly funded and then reissue all of their laws, um, we will be in this space of the unregulated. Next. Okay. So, Atchison versus law. So first of all, let me just, as somebody who does empirical research and has worked on studies with testers, I've never really seen anybody who self-appoints themselves as a tester. Like, I've not seen this. So technically, I've been a part of tester studies. What you do is you get match pairs, you make sure they have all the criteria, and the only difference is their race, their gender, their ability, whichever is the thing. You send them in, you record them, you, you collect the data, and it's fine. I've not, she is a, a self-described tester. Deborah's like, I'm going to go in and challenge a bunch of places and see if they are living up to their requirements under the ADA. So as it turns out, she has sued people many times um, for violations of the ADA. And this time with Atchison, she basically goes to their website um, and finds that they are failing to publish the information about accessibility on their website. Now she herself is a, a disabled person, but they're failing to disclose information uh, uh, about accessibility that they're required to. So she sues them, saying, you're not doing what you're supposed to. And then the court does something it's supposed to do in all of its cases, which is to ask the question, well, do you, do have, do you have standing? To sue, right? So standing is this concept that you must be the appropriate person to bring the claim. Now, it's right that you should think, well, if somebody is disabled, don't they have the right to challenge a hotel's disability policy? Well, if they ever were somebody who stayed at the hotel or had plans to stay at the hotel, and as it turns out, there is no proof um, that she had any plans. And so standing requires that you have an injury in fact, uh, created by the activities of the person you're suing, which is redressable by the court. So the district court dismisses the lawsuit claiming she doesn't have standing because she had no plans to visit the hotel and therefore suffered no injury as a result of the lack of information on the website. But the Court of Appeals for the First Circuit um, said that her lack of intent to book a room uh, at a hotel operated by Atchison does not make, negate the fact of injury. I find this perplexing. Uh, we have a set of standing cases where um, uh, if you can present any evidence that you were going to use a resource. So people sue based on environmental damages all the time. And if you can show, I had a plane ticket and I wanted to go to the affected region, but now I can't go because the water is polluted. I was planning, she didn't even have any evidence that she was going to stay in an Atchison hotel. So this first district ruling that there is entry even though she had no proof um, is pretty different from most of the standing cases. Uh, we have already. But here's where this gets interesting. So I don't know what happens, because she's a frequent, um, we call them frequent flyers, people who litigate the same issue over and over again. Something happens, because she basically came to the court several weeks ago and said, ah, I changed my mind. Um, I want to withdraw this case now. I want to take it out of the Supreme Court. And on a, a response they gave on August 10th, the court said, no. And I'm like, hmm. This is perplexing. And so I start digging around today, and this, as it turns out, you know who wants the case to stand? Atchison. The hotel chain wants the case to stand. And why? It's tired of people. But I don't, I'm not trying to say Atchison is tired of doing proper um, accommodations when they said. I think they're tired of frivolous suits from people who are dragging them into court. Um, and then in this case, you know, when they see they can't win uh, running away, they, they are arguing they're entitled to their day in court. Um, because they, and I actually think it would be good for the court to take this case because I want to know if we've changed the standing doctrine. Um, I want to know that, that what constitute as an injury has changed, right? Because typically when the court talks about the injury, it cannot be something that is illusory, right? It has to be an injury that is either currently happening or imminent. Um, and I'll give you a famous case of no standing so you can see how this seems a little bit nutty. Um, Lyons case, famous case from um, LA involving the police using chokeholds. 
Um, so Mr. Lyons sues the police because he um, is taken into custody by them. They use a chokehold on him. He has real injuries um, uh, from that encounter. He comes back to sue them for injunctive relief. So that's not for declaratory or money damages. He wants injunctive relief. Is he wants to stop the police from using the chokehold. There's a, there's a nice book out there by um, Paul Butler who teaches at Georgetown called Chokehold, all about police use of this um, uh, tactic. So he goes into court to sue based on the chokehold, and the Supreme Court says, wait, nope, you don't have standing. <laughs> so what do you mean? They choked me out. It's like, yes, you don't have standing because you can't prove that you will again be subject to a chokehold, and in order to uh, in order to have standing, you have to have proof, at least standing for injunctive relief to stop it, you have to have proof that you would be subject again. So here's my theory, you know, can't we, why don't you cobble the case together in a way that tries to sue on behalf of all people um, who could be um, subject to a chokehold because you know um, that they're still using the policy. But the, basically the court said, based on the type of relief he sought, he was an inappropriate plaintiff. And so, to think about the First Circuit sort of saying, even though she had no, um, and she neither stayed in the hotel or had no intent to stay in the hotel, she still has standing, they have to see that there is some injury, generalizable injury that occurs from having an obligation to display one's um, uh, accommodations and not. That's all I can think of that. But it's interesting that the court wants to tell us um, uh, either way because as I said, she said, oh, my bad, take it back, I'm gonna just go home, and they're like, no, come see us um, in October, um, which is when she'll go there. So, the final case, and then we'll open up the questions, is Alexander versus the South Carolina State Conference of the NAACP. So again, after the 2020 census, South Carolina's Republican-controlled General Assembly, their legislature, approved a changed congressional map that moved thousands of black voters into a different district, um, effectively making the district a safer seat for a Republican. So immediately, the South Carolina um, NAACP sued, claiming that this violated, again, the Voting Rights Act. You shouldn't be able to gerrymander. You shouldn't be um, divesting people of the, um, the franchisement of their vote. And I like this um, answer. So a three-judge panel came back and concluded the redistricting constituted an unconstitutional racial gerrymander. You are using race to, to, to try to, to uh, affect the outcome of the election. And then South Carolina's like, but wait, no. We didn't move them because they were black. We moved them because they were Democrats. <laughs> they weren't racially gerrymandering. They were politically gerrymandering. And I actually had to stop. And why does that matter? Because if there was a good faith explanation for how they were trying to construct the, the district that didn't involve the consideration of race, they believed that the, the district should be allowed uh, to stay. And so really the question is, what do you do when there's an overlap between racial groups and political affiliations? Because, um, and the, the NAACP um, conceded this, the overwhelming majority of the black uh, residents who were moved were in fact Democrats, um, which is not inconsistent uh, with many localities. And so um, here's the couple of things that I think about this case. First of all, there's the question um, of, uh, you know, of South Carolina claiming, um, you know, we weren't intending to create a racial um, outcome. It just happened because we were considering politics. Well, just so you know, in other areas of the law, if you do something that creates a racial effect or impact, it doesn't necessarily create an availability of a remedy to you under law because under most of the constitutional standards um, uh, in this country, you need both a disparate impact and a discriminatory intent. So it can't just be that it has a negative impact on a protected class group. It has to be that the intent of the people who undertook the action was to create um, the disadvantage. So they're not, they're, you know, South Carolina's not crazy, more like crazy like a fox. They're arguing, um, we're not wicked racist, you know, we're just, you know, politically committed. And so, um, so on the one hand, they might actually be on to something, because if they actually could show it wasn't racial animus, and we just got this racial effect of a political decision, I do think, you know, there's at least some wing of the court that will be open to hearing it. Now, let me tell you, if they succeed, everybody's gonna be like, oh, 
Alabama's coming back. We, we take back. It wasn't race. It's politics. <laughs> and the real issue is to, to this is going to be hard to simply apply Milligan to. Because the Milligan case was really about between two senses, between two senses taking periods, the black population had grown by such a huge amount that what Justice Kavanaugh was saying, it's undeniable that the amount of growth would, uh, would result in creating a separate district. So he talks about this notion of, this is not just race consciousness, this is race domination. There's a, this, this group is large, in charge in this area, and should be allowed to elect. This is uh, several thousand. And I'm not sure what Justice Kavanaugh will say about moving several thousand people, and whether um, that will matter to him. I'm not sure what this political argument uh, will do for him. But, there are many things for which race overlaps with another element. The most consistent overlapping um, other category is often class, right? And in uh, law, uh, we often talk about intersectionalities, you know, parts of one's identity, race, gender, sexuality, socioeconomic class, having um, intersections that also produce overlapping and reinforcing forms of bias or discrimination. But the point being is, um, I will say this. Having just done a gerrymandering case or a Section 2 case last year, one would ask, why does the court want to bring this um, unless it's prepared to tell us something different, right? Literally, the, the last term, we just had Allen versus Milligan. Why are they taking this case unless they think there's some component? No, I, I can theorize, well, it's because we've not heard this it's not race, it's politics um, claim in quite the same way um, they're fashioning it, but, uh, but who knows? But anyway, I will stop there.